Welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and this is a program where we get to bring you guests from around the world. And our guest tonight is actually a well-known faith face to many of our viewers. You know her because she's a prolific writer on subjects like the holy souls and purgatory. So much, she gets called the purgatory lady. She also has been writing a lot a reflection on St. Faustina and the contents of her diary. She's here today to share with us how we can make Lent more meaningful by meditating on the sufferings of Christ in order to shed His light and His grace on our own sufferings and salvation. She's the author of a brand new book called Praying with Jesus and Faustina during Lent and in times of suffering. Joining us via Skype from Chicago, Illinois, please welcome Susan Tassoni. Susan, how are you? Oh, fa Father Mitch, it's great to see you because I know you're in warm weather. <laughs> we're doing fine. We're, we're, we're uh, knee. I think the snow is taller than I am, uh, but it's sunny and it's uh, it's, there's a lot of it. <laughs> well, actually, I'm not in warm weather. The South is also under a lot of very cold weather. And, one, and it's a good reminder for us to keep in mind uh, the folks, especially in Texas, who have oh, had yes. power outages and are in sub-zero in some places, some sub-zero temperatures. So keep uh, them in prayer but it's cold down here too in alabama it's it's i think it's relative you're you know you're cold it might be warmer for us yeah you know your 20 degrees is probably a little heat wave for us but but uh but it's still uh you know it's still winter yep. and it's lent so happy ash wednesday father and to you too happy ash wednesday um this is the beginning of lent and it's a good time for us to consider two things. Lent is definitely oriented to moving to Holy Week, the week in which we recall the sufferings of Christ, not only his entrance on Palm Sunday in triumph, but the quick turn that happened when people crucified him, but tortured him before that, lied about him in trials, all of these were tremendous sufferings, not to mention the fact that the apostles either betrayed him with a kiss, as in the case of mm. Judas, or they ran away, and the Pope denied even knowing him. So this is, this is a lot of pain and suffering on lots of levels. Mm. And this is the topic of your new book with help from St. Faustina. Oh, direct help from uh, Jesus and Faustina. I, I, I'm really excited to share this with you because we really hit a nerve, Father. Uh, I got a call from Father Dan Canberra, and I know when I get a call from him, I, it's another book. And he, he, so he called me when we were in lockdown in last March, and he, he said, he calls my books by colors. He said, you know that Burgundy book? And I said, I said, you mean Praying with Jesus and Faustina for the Conversion of Sinners? Uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, that prayer book. He said, those meditations on the passion and the meditations on um, that what that Faustina visualized that saw he said they're so they're so powerful and they're so graphic can you take those and put it in another book I said no <laughs> but but at that moment it was funny he called because he's called for all six books I knew I was thinking about the passion during that lockdown and I six years of writing for Faustina six books there were, the passion came up over and over again, Father, and I made sure out of all these six books that there was always a, a, a chapter on the passion. So this just, he just confirmed, I have to do this, and it was there to begin with. So, so the focus of the book, uh, Father, is coming from the actual words of Jesus and Faustina, which makes it unique and very special. And it perfectly addresses the terrible times that you're talking about we're experiencing not only with the weather, with the COVID, uh, and the terrible sufferings that we're experiencing today. So there's a, it addresses both. Right. Um, and I also realized, you know, there's a lot of Lent books out there, a lot of good ones, 
And I, you, you want to do something that's not like, you know, it's like banks. You got 20 zillion banks, but what makes your bank different? And what made this book different was the, the a contemporary book that has a combination of Jesus and Faustina together conversing back and forth about his passion, what he experienced, how he should, how she should offer up the sacrifices, model him. And so I wanted to capture the words about his sorrows that he shared with her, his sacrificial death um, that he shared only, not only with her, but with us. And so it's Ash Wednesday. The book starts out with Shrove Tuesday. Uh, and, and, uh, and I purposely did that because I learned something about Shrove Tuesday, Father, uh, Pius the 12th. Uh, made that the uh, the day that's dedicated to the holy face and shrove, shrove means to absolve and that's the day back probably be before my time you're a little older than me maybe you might know this father uh, uh, but it, it was a time that people went to confession on that day mm -hmm. so 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 i started with shrove tuesday and then today's ash wednesday and i wanted to share what i wrote today on ash wednesday and this is what uh this is what Jesus said. He says, you please me most when you meditate on my sorrowful passion. The contemplation of my painful wounds is of great profit to you, and it brings me great joy. So what is it saying? Well, if you want to please Jesus and delight him, this is one of the ways that you do that. This mm -hmm. is the this is this is opens the window to please and delight him. And then he goes on, Father. And again, these quotes are all from the book because I start with show Tuesday and take you all the way to Divine Mercy Sunday. And that's only part one. But this is what he said. There, Jesus said, there are few souls who contemplate my passion with true feeling. I give great graces to souls who meditate devoutly on my passion. Then he says again, my daughter, your compassion for me refreshes me. Meditating on my passion, your soul acquires a distinct beauty. So we've got Jesus also in, in the book, um, uh, taking, leading Faustina and us through his passion and the stations. And what I found too, Father, I have the stations, but there was also meditations in between, you know, that, that Jesus experienced before the garden, you know, before he was prostrate in the garden, before he, he wept blood. Uh, so I, I was filling in the gaps as well with the stations. So you've got some meditations and then you have the stations. And so, um, then you have Faustina speaking, and she experienced the stigmata. And you don't hear too much about that, Father, because uh, it was invisible. And I, and I didn't find it. It was kind of hidden in the diary, but she said this. She said, um, I suffered pain in my body, in my hands, my feet, and my side. Jesus is sending me this kind of suffering that I may make reparation for sinners. And then she goes on to say, in difficult moments, I must take refuge in the wounds of Jesus. I must seek consolation, comfort, light, and affirmation in the wounds of Jesus. Um, then I find this out, Father. And again, it's a little uh, from a, a priest friend. He said that, you know, before Vatican II, and again, maybe you may know this, Father. You have one or two years ahead of me, uh, that the that we, we offered the stations on Friday. And right. then there was a, a, a devotion to the wounds. I didn't know that. You know, there's a, there was a devotion to the wounds. People had a special devotion during Lent to the wounds. I said, my goodness. And so what I did, besides the 50 days, the next chapter or section of the book, Father, I call it the wound section. And it, and it has these unusual, rare um, prayers and litanies about the wounds. I had Claire of Assisi that focused on the five wounds. But I took it further than that because it wasn't just the five wounds that he suffered, his hands, his feet. His, it was his face. Um, and, and that's where we get the devotion of the Holy Face on Tuesday. They spat at him. They slapped him. Um, they insulted him. The blood from the uh, crown of thorns came down in his eyes where he could barely open his eyes because the blood was clotting. He could barely, I read some of the, some of the description, he could barely see his mother looking at his mother. Uh, so we have uh, the Precious Blood Litany, um, which is one of the five official litanies uh, of the church. But I also found, Father, Catherine of Siena wrote a litany of the Precious Blood that was breathtaking. So we have that in there. We have the Holy Face. We have the shoulder wound. So we included all the wounds, the Precious Blood. And so this, this particular section gives you the opportunity 
that he's asking you to do to focus on his wounds. You know, one of the very important parts of this is that so many of us pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet that was revealed to St. Faustina. And in there we say, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us yes. and on the whole world. And it is hard for us to understand the depth of that if we don't meditate on the passion of Christ and understand what his suffering meant and to be as concrete as possible. This is the reality of God becoming flesh is that he really did suffer. There was a temptation to heresy in the first century that was repeated many times over the centuries. Namely, uh, it's called docetism. Docetism is a heresy that teaches that Jesus seemed to be human or looked like he was human, but really it was just a costume. It was not real. And it was a heresy influenced by a lot of the ancient Greek and Roman paganism where the pagan gods would look like humans but then go right back to their divine status. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were just play acting. That is not our doctrine. We, docetism was rejected because Christ really did take on human flesh. He took on a full human nature. And as such, he really did suffer. This wasn't play acting. Mm -hmm. It was authentic pain and torture and mockery. All of this was done to him. And it's, it's inspired uh, our art over the centuries. I think your contribution here is partly because in the 1960s, the crucifixes were often removed from our churches in the 60s and 70s. And the suffering of Christ was de-emphasized. Stations were de-emphasized, even during Lent, and sometimes stopped. And instead of making the stations, some people were doing labyrinths and things like that. Whereas mm -hmm. it misses out on this reality of Christ really suffering for us. And this is what I think you're bringing out so nicely. It, it, uh, it, it, it brings you very close to him. In fact, what I was trying to do too, Father, I have, uh, so it's called Praying with Jesus and Faustina during Lent. And then I, I didn't want to narrow it just to Lent. I, I added, and in times of suffering, because right. we suffer. And I, I wanted to expand that. And so we have a, a really unique section in the book called In Times of Suffering. And the fact of the matter is, is because we suffer, um, it, you know, Faustina suffered. You know, she suffered in every way, shape, or form. She suffered physically because she had a terminal illness. She had tuberculosis. She had the stigmata, uh, uh, you know, where she experienced the passion in her body, uh, although although um, she it was invisible. She suffered emotionally, Father, where uh, because the sisters didn't believe uh, that she was sick, and so she was trying. She they thought that she was trying to avoid work. Um, they made fun of her. Father, they insulted her. Um, they called her dumb. They, she suffered mentally because she was concerned. She's had she had these visions of Jesus and Mary for three years, and it, it, you know she was doubting herself because she thought she was going crazy. So she had you know that concern, that fear, and then on top of all these sufferings, she was given the mission to spread the message of divine mercy. And how was she going to do that? Because she, you know, she lived in a convent. And so I, I was trying to pull in, in that section, in times of suffering, real actual sufferings that she experienced. What, and, and, and Jesus coming in and telling her, 
What's the purpose of suffering? Why do we suffer? Is there any value for self, of, of suffering? And you know, who her best teacher was, uh, a father? Jesus was her best teacher because he told her how to handle suffering. He shared with her the value of suffering and how you can take this daily, um, these daily uh, sac, well, these, what? You can take your daily work, if you will, which includes suffering and frustration, and it can be transformed into a sacrifice. It can be transformed into a sacrifice of peace in your heart, peace in the world, peace in your family, conversion of sinners, and even for the um, for the souls in purgatory. And he said this, uh, Father, he said this to her. He said, join your little sacrifices to my sorrowful passion. There it is again. The smallest sacrifice finds great value before my majesty. And then he tells her, why meditating on his passion is important to him. Why is it important to him? And this is a spoiler alert, Father. It's because of his love, because of his love for you. Um, and there's a great, great quote that I, you know, after six years, you think you've seen everything in the, script, in the, in the diary, but God must put blinders on me because it would have not fit in anywhere else. But it, he, it, the, you know, the, um, the order, sisters, uh, Sister Faustina's congregation, in their constitution, Father, they strongly recommend that the sisters ponder um, God's salvation, starting with the incarnation, the passion, and the glory that we're going to experience. Mm -hmm. And so the passion was part of her constitution that she, that the nuns were told to ponder frequently. And so, so this is what Jesus said. He said, remember my passion. And if you don't believe my words, at least believe my wounds. He said, I came down, I came down from heaven out of love for you. I lived for you. I died for you. I created you. Before I made the world, I loved you. My love will never change. And the passion is the fullness of his love. And mm -hmm. this is what Faustina said. I, it's just probably one of my favorite quotes. She said this, Father, you could have saved thousands of worlds with one word, a sigh from the manger. Uh, that's my little part in there. Uh, a single sigh from Jesus would have satisfied your justice. But you yourself, Jesus, purely out of love for us, underwent such a terrible passion. Your father's justice would have been propitiated, that means appeased, with a single sigh from you. And all your self-abasement is, is solely the work of your mercy and your inconceivable love. So she came to know by meditating on the passion, she came to know them again, the mystery of God's love. And she said, this is Faustina, she said, all our lives are immersed in his divine mercy every day and most profoundly in the sacraments of confession and the Eucharist. Our mercy is deepened by receiving the sacraments. It expands our hearts to be merciful. Um, and she said that, she said his mercy is like a golden thread running throughout our whole lives. You know, this is uh, another very important lesson in particular for our time because we certainly see that there's a lot of anger in our country right now. And the divisions that make it impossible to communicate as people seek a very good reality called justice, but we see that it is without mercy and the mercy is perceived as weakness and there's a rejection of mercifulness. And this approach to justice characterized much of the 20th century where people wanted a just society and were willing to kill 300 million people in order to get it. Of course, creating their own injustices in the name of national socialism and communism and so, so on. And this idea that we first find mercy from God and that this makes it possible for us to be merciful because we've received mercy. This is key. And I don't think it is an accident 
that as various forces push God out of our culture, our society becomes increasingly merciless. Mm -hmm. That it's only when we come to God, when we come to God made flesh and see in Jesus Christ this source of mercy for us, our sins are forgiven, then we can show mercy to others. This is very key. You, you nailed it, Father. That divine mercy message is the same as it was in Faustina's time. In fact, I think you know she was, wasn't was able to, to get it out, but it's out now, and it's, it really is appropriate for our time because um, he, he does, Jesus wants to remind us of mercy, and that's his greatest attribute. And so how do you translate that? You said it, Father, to be merciful to yourself, uh, to be merciful to others, to forgive yourself, forgive others, and in, in doing it in a charitable way, in terms of sharing disagreements without becoming disagreeable, and to turn to divine mercy for comfort and for advice. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is much needed as um, we, we see again uh, j just yesterday, more people were breaking other people's property as a way to promote the defunding of police. And they end up having to bring down the police upon them because they're breaking the law. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, this is, you, you ironically end up destroying yourself when you choose to be merciless, you end up undoing your own uh, projects. Whereas mercy opens up the ways for us to accept other people as fellow sinners. This is one of the other great things about focusing on the suffering of Christ and the forgiveness of sins that he accomplished for us, that we also begin to see that I'm living in the world of my fellow sinners. I need the mercy. I can give mercy to others and show them love because I received mercy. It's a grace to me first, and then I can extend it to others. And um, in the present climate, there is such a lack of that, um, that we, we, we have to respond by focusing all the more on Christ and not on ourselves. Yeah, Father, you know, the, every person, you know, wherever he or she lives is marked by the cross. We all have a cross. And Faustina, her struggles in her community life was a cross for her. Mm -hmm. um, just like a family, a congregation is made up of various personalities, various weaknesses, um, because it's made up of ordinary people and not angels. And so Faustina saw the good in her suffering, and she she related that to to life in the community. And she saw that you know that that having to deal with these you know this friction that it purified her of selfishness. Or, or different weaknesses, and it created space for love. And as a result, it transformed into a good for herself and for others. So her own purification made her capable of, of, of greater love. Uh, and it was, a more, it was more complete union with Jesus because she was becoming a free person and she was able to love everyone, even those that were difficult um, and were not kind to her and were not even good to her. I think this is very much connected with our own prayer of the morning offering every day. Because in the morning offering, this is a, uh, a devotion that we Jesuits have traditionally pushed hard as part of our commitment to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And one, one of the points that I think we need to draw from is it says, I offer you all my prayers works and sufferings of the day. You know, th this is what I have to give. And I always like to bring out, I, when I was talking about uh, the Eucharist in my uh, Tuesday Bible studies, I mentioned how at the offertory, we offer up bread and wine, 
But the reason that we have bread is that grains of wheat are crushed, mixed with water, and then yeah. baked. We have wine because grapes are crushed, fermented, and then become wine. Those are wonderful symbols of our suffering, where we get crushed and baked and fermented by life. But then we can take our difficulties and our sufferings and offer them up with the bread and wine at the offering. That's what we give Jesus. Yeah. And then just as he consecrates the bread into his body and the wine into his blood, so also does he at the moment of consecration unite our sufferings with his. And at that moment, that we especially are representing Christ's death on the cross at the moment of the consecration. That's when he also unites our sufferings with him so that we become part of what he is offering. It's, that's what St. Paul meant in uh, Colossians 1, 24 and 25. I make up for what is lacking in the <laughs> sufferings of Christ by my own sufferings for the sake of his body, the church, that I'm offering this up. This is the continuing and fulfilling out of his sufferings in the whole body of Christ for the sake of his church, which is his sacred, his mystical body. Outstanding, Father Mitch, outstanding. Uh, so uh, it, it, to take it a little step further, I think that that's the point I wanted to cover because well, many people suffer. A lot of a lot of uh, listeners are are suffering at home. They're they're homebound uh, for all kinds of reasons. And I wanted to point out, what, and again, this is in the book, what Jesus said in terms of the value of suffering um, and how powerful it is, and how it's a form of prayer. He told Faustina, "I have need of your sufferings to rescue souls." There's but one price at which souls are bought, and that is suffering united to my suffering on the cross. Mm -hmm. You will join your prayers, your fast, mortifications, labor, and all sufferings to my prayer, just what you're talking about, my prayer, fasting, mortification, labors, and sufferings, that they will have power before my Father. Help me to save souls. Join your sufferings to my passion and offer them to the Heavenly Father for sinners. And then he, he goes on and he says, your, this is all in the book. Your suffering will become a source of your sanctification. And then Faustina says, I saw that my suffering in prayer shackled Satan and snatched many souls from his clutches. My sacrifice is nothing in itself, but when I join it to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it becomes all powerful and has the power to appease divine wrath. So that image of shackling father and snatching from his clutches you know, it sounds like a fairy tale, except it's true. But you can snatch these souls out of heaven. Um, he's, you know, he's not a fairy tale character, Satan. Frightening, yes, but invincible, no. Um, and you have the power by offering up your sacrifice, your suffering to help save countless souls. This <laughs> is uh, an important element. Were you going to say add something there? Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. you do, I mean, I just have to add this. Um, this is another powerful quote because, in, 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 so we have the book and we have in times of suffering, and these, this, uh, this comes from Faustina's words and her prayers and experiences, everyday experiences. But, but I, you know, as I write the book, I think that like anybody else, well, what if I can't pray? Well, this is what, um, this is what Jesus told Faustina. She was feeling sick. Um, and she was trying to offer her sufferings and meditate on his passion one uh, one day. And so she couldn't. And she complained to the Lord and said, I wanted so much to steep my sorrowful, myself into your sorrowful passion, but my sufferings had not allowed me to do so. And this is what he said to her. Daughter, know that if I allow you to feel and have a more profound knowledge of my sufferings, that's a grace. But when your mind is dim and your sufferings are great, it's then that you take an active part in my passion and I am conforming you more fully to myself. For those that can't pray, your prayer is a huge suffering. Hence the morning offering. That's what we offer up. 
we have to take a little break. Uh, we'll be back in just a couple more minutes. So please stay with us as we continue our conversation with Susan Tassoni on St. Faustina and the Passion of Christ as a way to pray through this Lent. Please stay with us. Right, we are speaking with Susan Tassoni, who has a brand new book called Praying with Jesus and Faustina During Lent and in Times of Suffering. This is a brand new book, just been out a couple of weeks, and it is available at EWTNRC.com, a religious catalog. It is item number 4276, 4276. And you can get it at EWTNRC.com. Susan, um, thank you for being with us tonight talking about this. Uh, this you obviously intend for this to be uh, a devotional during Lent and other times of suffering. But this is a, a great tool for people to use as they meditate through each day of Lent. Right. But I have to say this, Father, I wanted to mention this. Uh, we were talking about suffering and the kinds of suffering that she experienced and the kinds mm -hmm. of suffering we experienced. And if you don't mind me saying this, I have to plug this for you, Father, because it's not you. You didn't pay me for it. Uh, but you have a book out, Weed, Weed and Tears. Is that the title yes, of it? Yes, Weed uh, and Tears. It, it, your book actually uh, focuses on, uh, uh, you can explain, the, is it child abuse? or? Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's the... I, I try to deal with the sexual abuse crisis from a number of perspectives. And one of the approaches I take, you know, the, the first part is comparing the apostles and their moral failures to that of the, the clergy and hierarchy and the moral failures either by being abusers or by not knowing how to deal with the abuse or neglecting it, covering it up, all the variety of things that occurred. But to me, the, the, the part I spent the most time praying over, I, I prayed a lot over all of it. I write before the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and the part that I spent a lot of time relates strongly with your book. I went through the passion of Christ. The passion, exactly. Step by step, you know, from the uh, agony in the garden, the arrest, the various trials, various, I think there's six times that the soldiers mocked our Lord, and then the physical suffering as well with the scourging and crucifixion, crowning the thorns. And I connect that with the suffering of the victims of the abuse. Thanks. The children themselves, their families, their friends, and the church as a whole. And I think it's uh, very much like uh, the, the basic principle that you have uh, and, and St. Faustina has, which is in Scripture, uh, the, the uh, prophet Isaiah had said in Isaiah 53, that it is by his stripes we are, he healed. are healed. Yes. And that that healing of, comes to us through Christ's suffering. And we can resonate with it. We can experience you know, meditation on his passion and suffering and death as a way to uh, also find healing of our own pain by identifying various aspects of his suffering with the various right. aspects of ours. Exactly. It, it, it say, it's the same tie-in, Father, and I, I, I have to catch your book. But, but so, what else, so what did she do? How, do? how do you help? How do you cooperate? What can you do to help people that are suffering, um, children, 
she, Jesus told her to do the stations of the cross. He said, try your best to make the stations. And she said this, when I make the way of the cross, I'm deeply moved at the 12th station, which is Jesus dies on the cross. I, I reflect on the omnip no, omnipotence of God's mercy, which passed through the heart of Jesus. In this open wound of the heart of Jesus, I enclosed all poor humans and those individuals whom I love so as often as I make the way of the cross. Mother Angelica uh, would say that it, when you make the way of the cross, it softens your heart. It helps you to become more compassionate. And I learned it was Faustina's favorite devotion. And there's another person, um, uh, Father Mitch, that was a big fan of the, of the Stations of the Cross. That was St. John Paul II. He mm -hmm. would pray the Stations of the Cross right. every Friday, whether he was in a chapel or not. And here's a true story, Father, about about him. There was a, a there was a, a, a bishop that was uh, visiting this convent, and in the evening, the, it was time for you know for the sisters to you know shut the lights off, time for you know um, to retire for the evening. And she, the one nun, went to the chapel, and she heard this rustling sound, and she wasn't sure where it was coming from. So she looked down the aisle, Father, and she saw this bishop making the way of the cross on his knees. And so she she backed off, kept the lights on. But the next morning she shared this vision, this this beauty of this of this bishop praying uh, the the stations of the cross with the, with the nuns, not realizing that it was going to be St. John Paul II. Yeah. You know, this man of simple piety father, this man suffered with the people of his own time. He suffered hardship, he knew personal pain. He suffered, yeah. he summed it up everything in that quiet practice of going from station to station in many a church and many a chapel. And it's very powerful for the souls of purgatory uh, to pray the, the stations of the cross. Why? Because of the indulgences uh, that are um, that are attached to it. So yeah. so that's one thing she did. In fact, she would try to pray the stations prostrate in the shape of a cross. Uh, when she when when the sisters were in, in the chapel, she she would do that. So that's one thing she did. What else did she do? I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say she she included the souls in purgatory uh, uh, in in her sacrifices. And in, and I know you know this, Father. Um, I I had to catch up with you. The Byzantine Catholics do not celebrate All Souls Day. They celebrate All Souls Saturdays during Lent. Every Saturday is given over, Every all the liturgy is given over to the souls in purgatory. They have a roll call. There's an icon corner where people can write names. And so the purpose is, is that so the souls in purgatory can, can participate in your sacrifice and they too can rise at Easter. And in fact, Easter is the second greatest number of souls um, uh, that are released from purgatory. Christmas is the first. So so, so that's something else that... Um, that that we have to we can include is the souls in purgatory. Uh, another thing she did was, and this is over and over again in all the books throughout the diary, the chaplet, pray the chaplet of um, divine mercy. And you you took that title from my book. Not that you don't you didn't know this, Father. I had the same idea for the sake of a sorrowful passion. You said to pray it for the dying um, because it has it, it's it's very powerful for somebody that's in despair and to help that soul even if you're not present uh, you can still say the uh, say the chaplet so throughout lent you can up your up your prayer life with with Faustina, with the stations with the chaplet you could um, fast and if you can't fast we have a litany of fasting um in our book in fact i learned a lot about litanies father you know chin does a lot of litanies uh, uh, some programs that have litanies and litanies are actually forms of prayer to petition god or a particular saint or Our Lady for prayers and protection mm -hmm. uh, and plagues. And I also learned that John Paul, in his kneeler, he prayed a ton of litanies, um, it, you know, every day. So litanies are very powerful. And of course, we have some very uh, special rare litanies that we included. And I would be remiss to say again, back to the souls, offer masses during during uh, during uh, during Lent. You could have a mass offered. You can attend mass. We always talk about the pious union of Saint Joseph. It's the year of Joseph. Joseph appeared to Faustina and said, I'm there to protect you, to support you. He encouraged her to say the memorari. Um, but but we have one organization in the United States called the Pious Union of St. Joseph that prays for the dying. You know, you could have masses offered through them, living and deceased, you know, for your family tree. That's another thing she did. She offered masses. She prayed the rosary. Mm -hmm. She did the chaplet. 
um, and she prayed special litanies. Uh, I could, she had a special devotion to Our Lady. Uh, in, in, in order to get closer to God, you get closer to the mother. And uh, the, our, where was Our Lady? What role did she play? We have a section in the book as well where you can consecrate yourself to Our Lady. She was there, Father. She was there at the cross. She was there when he was, you know, walking down that road to Calvary. She was there when he was dying. She was there when he died. She was there to take him in her arms. You know, this is a mother and a son. Um, and what did she do? She didn't lose faith. You know, she did not lose faith. She, in fact, you know, she exercised her faith. So we have to have a special devotion to Our Lady as Faustina did. Mm -hmm. You know, and in particular, Our Lady of Sorrows, uh, during this time of Lent, uh, this is a, a great devotion for us to have as well. Um, I, I think uh, it's uh, another element of this is in praying for the living. Um, something I, I've been doing for the last years, as we see very much a pandemic of pornography that's been going on long before COVID-19. There, there's been a pandemic of the use of pornography. And when people want to deal with this on this, their spiritual level, I strongly recommend that they pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And there are one reason being you pray for us sinners and the whole world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that this is very important. The same thing is true in praying the Holy Rosary. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, not those sinners. Uh, people who participate in this pornography industry need to pray for the people that they were looking at and transform their temptation to go back to that uh, form of, of uh, perversion and pray for the people. In general, that's a crowd that doesn't have a lot of their own friends praying for them and their colleagues in their work and business don't pray for them. So I ask people who have been guilty of looking at things that are improper, to pr ask for mercy for them. And I think to do this for so many of the other situations that we have where people are angry, you know, the, um, the, the boiling temperature rises quickly over political differences and social issues. And so to make sure that especially during this Lenten time, we pray for us sinners and the whole world. This is very much part of our task at this time. And your devotional helps to remind us of that need to pray for our fellow sinners, whether they're living or dead. We need to have that kind of prayer. Absolutely, you 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 just nail it every time. Maybe that's why you're you're a good archer, Father. <laughs> um, that there was something in in the diary, and again, it's in the book because Faustina was upset with the world, and she said she said to him, you know, she basically said, I need to talk to you, and he said, okay, speak, and she said, you know, I I people don't uh, uh, they don't honor you properly. They, they're, they're, your servants are oppressed, they're persecuted. Many souls are rushing into the abyss of hell. Um, and even though I see you and I experience this ex ecstasy, it gnaws at my heart and bones. And although you show me special love and inundate my heart with streams of your joy, it doesn't appease the sufferings I've just mentioned. And, and then he, I'm, I'm just skipping ahead. He says, his response to her, my daughter, those words of yours are pleasing to me. By saying the chaplet, you are bringing human, humankind closer to me. So, in fact, we have the nine-day novena. And what is that? He has groups of people, you know, that we cover for nine days uh, to include in the chaplet. And that's actually for the conversion of the world, Father. People usually say it on starting on Good Friday until Divine, uh, Holy Saturday. 
And really, he's saying to say it year round, and it's for the purpose of the conversion of the world by yeah. a prayer, doing that novena with that chaplet. Yep, this this is important, and to for folks to remember the times in which she's worried about sinners. You know, the Poland's neighbors to the east had already become communist, and oh, by the time she died in 1938, already tens of millions of citizens of the Soviet Union had been executed or starved mm. to death by their own mm. government. Many times because they were believers, other times just because they owned some small property. And then the neighbors to the West in Germany had already elected Adolf Hitler as Reichskanzler. And the, within uh, 11 months after her death, Poland was invaded by both neighbors. The Germans invaded September 1st, and then a few weeks later, the Russians invaded. The, the sin that she's talking about is not just people being naughty, but this was two nations surrounding her own country filled with hatred and murderous intent, and her own government leaders, Marshal Pilsudski, were themselves not living a good Catholic life and were themselves nationalistic rather than Catholic. And this was, you know, not a great situation for Poland or the, the world at large. That's where she's coming from, praying for very serious issues and serious sinful situations of communism and Nazism on either side of her country. And at a time when the world became radically merciless, killing, again, hundreds of millions of people in the name of socialism and communism and atheism, she was praying for mercy. And this is important for us to have perspective on our own times about the importance of praying for mercy so that as difficult and tense as we might experience life right now, it could get worse. It can always get worse. Sin can always make things worse. And we're called to be the receivers of mercy so that we can show mercy. And then, we, and as we show mercy, we receive it back. That's the Beatitudes and the Our Father. Exactly, Father. And how did she, how did she cope with this? Like you said, how do you cope with this? She prayed um, and she said to Jesus, don't leave me alone. Uh, don't leave me alone in my suffering. And he said, you know, don't be afraid of what will happen to you. I'll give you nothing beyond your strength. You know the power of my grace. Let that be enough for you. And then he goes on, he says, your, your silent day-to-day -day martyrdom is complete submission to my will. Do the will of God in the present moment. We've heard that from Mother Angelica. And when it seems that to you that your suffering exceeds your strength, contemplate my wounds and you will rise above the human scorn and judgment. Meditation on my passion will help you uh, uh, rise above all things. And then he goes on. He says, well, what was her strength? It was the Eucharist, Father. It was the Eucharist. He said, understand the strength by which you bear sufferings comes from frequent communion. So approach this fountain of mercy often to draw with a vessel of trust whatever you need. It's hard to receive communion. I know in Chicago, uh, there's only two masses a day here when there used to be seven um, so we have a spiritual communion that we put in the book by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Uh, so, he, you know, don't, it's, it's, you said it could get worse, but it, you, you have to pray. You have to it, just follow what Faustina, what he told Faustina, what he's telling us, the chaplet, uh, don't be afraid, be at peace, don't fear death. And by not fearing death, how do you not fear death? Stay in his will, stay in the boat, you know, do God's will in the present moment. Go to confession. That was huge, Father. Um, he, he said it uh, It just pleases him when we don't go to confession. And I have to add this, Father. We had a couple it, of Did you say it pleases him when we don't go to confession? When we do. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought no, no, I want to make sure that that gets clarified. 
but he but he does say it pleases it displeases. I said oh, you're right. Displeases him when we don't go to confession. Yeah. It displeases him. Thank you, Father. <laughs> you're listening. Yeah. Um, but I have to I have to share this. We had an aunt an aunt that died of COVID. It was boom that quick. And what 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 happened? She was out of state. Father, you, you I can't tell how many hours it took me to find a priest. Uh, and so it was a lesson. It was a wake-up call. Get to confession regularly because you don't know. And the priest that we did find, Father, it dro- he drove three hours to get to her. And, and he had to be a special COVID priest. It wasn't just a priest that you call in the area, the p- parish that was assigned, you know, that was assigned to this hospital. No, it had to be a COVID priest, and he had to be available. And that man, that holy priest drove three hours to get to my aunt. And it just woke me up saying, you know, get to confession monthly. Uh, and then in the back of the book, we have uh, things that Jesus said about confession and what Faustina said um, uh, that we shared with everyone. Um, adore him and pray and offer sacrifices for your families. Because he said, persevere, don't give up. Because when if you do give up, you're going to block what he's trying to do through you and in you. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it just, you know, um, it, that's in my conversion book. There's a whole thing about being persevering in prayer and not giving up. Yeah, yeah, no, this is uh, an, an important part. And traditionally, Lent has been a time when people do go to confession. The reason that we put ashes on ourselves, and the priest, the priest puts the ashes on us in Lent, Um, is to remind us of our mortality, that we are dust and unto dust we shall return. And that is meant to give us perspective so that I think about the meaning and purpose of my life and I take time to reflect, what am I doing? Matter of fact, St. Ignatius recommends that we imagine ourselves standing in front of Jesus Christ on the cross and then ask him, what have I done for you as he's hanging on the cross? And then to ask a second question, and what would Jesus say to you? What have you done for me? What would he say? And then to ask him, what am I doing for you now? And then what will I do for you? This is a way that St. Ignatius recommends we examine our conscience, not in terms of just an abstract theory of what's right and wrong, but in conversation with Jesus Christ. And again, your book is a way to help us enter into the passion of Christ, enter into his suffering so that we can have that perspective on our own sins. Now, Susan, we have just uh, about another minute or so. Any final comment? I think, you know, out of all the books I've done, with the six books I did, it was the same message over and over again, that his great love for us, Father, that he went to the cross, he went through excruciating pain, and I Correct me if I'm wrong, excruciating is from the Latin meaning from the cross. He didn't have to do that. He went beyond what you can imagine and bled to death to show how much he loves uh, loves us and that he created you and that you had a mission and that there's no one else like you and there'll never be another Father Mitch. There's never going to be anybody that can wear a cowboy boots like Father Mitch or wear a hat like you, Father. And you're, you know, we have a mission for this generation and to do, you know, fulfill that mission. And how do you learn? How do you know the mission? You pray, you pray and, you know, you, you do what all these things that Faustina did. And there was one thing that she uh, that came up again is, well, what if you don't love God? You know, that, that comes across, you know, if you don't feel love for God. Well, there was, there was a, a response to that. He, she said, you know, I saw this dear person that that loved God, but he didn't feel it. And I'll just cut to the chase. And uh, even though uh, he tried, but sometimes it wasn't there. And, and uh, it basically, our Lord said, this person is always pleasing to God um, because his heart is in it, even though he's always in Gethsemane. And, and that, you know, it, his okay. great patience will overcome it. Well, we have to really cut out. We're, we're flat out of time. Thank you for writing and thank Thanks, you for Father. being with us. 
And may the Lord bless all of you this Ash Wednesday, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we look forward to your support for the network so we can bring Susan and all the other guests and all the other programs. God bless you and take care.